If you're kind of a control freak like I am, this pandemic and the start of school may be making you a little bit crazy. In fact, the internet makes me a little bit crazy. Uh, you may have noticed that we're starting a little bit late because uh, we were told we could go live to LinkedIn and it kicked us out. So, but here we are. And, uh, you know, I think this time of year, most parents and teachers, uh, control freak, freaks or not, are feeling kind of overwhelmed with questions and uncertainty as they head into the new school year. We are going to talk about that today. This is LD Expert Live. In a typical school year, the start of school tends to carry with it some excitement, getting to see your new teacher and your friends and new clothes and, and cool school supplies. But this year is a little bit different. As a parent, you may have options for how your child is going to do school and you're not sure which is best. You may be struggling with some overwhelm yourself and wondering how you're going to get past that to support your child. Well, today, my guest, Dr. Regine Maradian, is going to give you some insights and tools for navigating this pandemic and the start of school. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and auditory processing and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers and the author of At Wit's End, A Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. This book will give you insight into your smart but struggling student. For a free copy, go to parentsatwitsend.com. Let's say hello to Maddie. Last hello. week, hi Maddie. Last week, we had some technical issues also. And uh, towards the end of the show, my internet went completely out and uh, Maddie had to jump in and pinch hit for me and she did a great job. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> you know, like a actual TV anchor, so very exciting. <laughs> so well, how Sorry, go, okay. What's, what's happening there in the chat already? Yeah, um, so we have a couple people checking in to say hi. We have Mona um, from Fusion Pasadena. Hello, Mona, thanks for watching. We saw your comment on the previous, um, the previous show we had created, so uh, thanks for also commenting here too. We love seeing everyone's comments, so make sure to say hi and let us know where you're checking in from and we love to read your questions and comments. Um, so yeah, I will be checking back in in a bit. I know I'm super excited for this topic today. It's all of my families, all of my students' parents are you know, looking for any kind of advice that they can get. So we're all really in the same boat. So I know this is going to be such a relevant topic for everyone. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what Dr. Maradian has to say. So um, yeah, I'm excited and I'll check in with everyone soon. Perfect, thank you, Maddie. Well, today we're talking about navigating the pandemic and the start of school with your kids. This is LD Expert Live and I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers where we help children and adults permanently change their learning and attention challenges. Our guest today is Dr. Regine Maradian. Dr. Maradian is a licensed clinical psychologist with over 10 years experience working with children, teens, and families dealing with a wide range of emotional, behavioral, and adjustment problems, such as depression, anxiety, relationship issues, eating disorders, and ADHD. She is fluent in five languages, how cool is that? And as a parent of three children, she understands the daily challenges of being a parent and the stressors associated with juggling a career and family life. Welcome, Dr. Maradian. Thank you, thank you so much for having me today. It's such a pleasure. Well. I am thrilled to have you. 
this pandemic is new territory for all of us. And, you know, you just don't know if what you're feeling is normal or if it's just you. Can you talk a little bit about what people are experiencing right now? Yes. So it's so interesting how, you know, since we started the pandemic back in March up until now, um, how many changes I've been seeing just in general with the people I'm working with and in my own family. Um, and uh, the whole concept of non-movement fatigue um, is such as irritability, nervousness, uh, people feeling anxious. And I feel it's not just children where even us as adults are feeling that. Um, and that's been a, a very difficult thing to, to grasp on and to understand. So we're seeing a lot of that and increased stressors. And uh, to compare what is non-movement fatigue to what it used to be, for example, we used to wake up early in the morning at 6 a.m., get lunches ready, you know, rushing out of the house, activities, work, et cetera. So we were constantly moving. And when I say that is the brain is in constant motion. And all of a sudden pandemic hits, the month of March, we're all excited in some ways, yay, we're out of school. But then it kind of took a toll and we started noticing this sluggishness and, and just fatigue because we're just not used to moving like we used to. And, and I know when we talked earlier, you said, you know, even if people, have started new exercise routines, which I think a lot of people have during this pandemic, it's not exactly the same, right? Yes, yes, I, yes exactly. I, I'm, you know, I'm associating it with kind of like some form of brain fatigue, right? And so, because we're just not, I mean, we're all feeling it, even though even myself, I'm active and keeping my kids active as much as we can, such as going on walks or outside. Um, I just feel like due to the schedule changing, sleeping changes, you know, being maybe more online and on devices has created just a, a, a big shift. Um, and also we have to keep in mind the mask wearing and all these changes that we are experiencing as a country and also our children are experiencing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, when I think about my days before this, I mean, I'm still working all the time, but it really is different because we're not having that, those quick interactions with people and kind of moving from place to place all the time. So, so our brains are maybe not getting alerted in the same way. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Well, I promised our viewers that we would give them five tools for navigating the pandemic and the start of school. And so the first of our five tips for parents is just to know that what you're experiencing is normal. I mean, you know, I think that's a pretty important thing to know because otherwise there's an added stressor of thinking, oh my gosh, does anyone else feel this? So yeah. number two is controlling negative thoughts. Science has proven that our words are powerful. Mm -hmm. So beating ourselves up for mistakes or challenges as struggling students are often prone to do never helps. You can't change the past, but you can learn from it. So at the learning centers, as learning specialists, we work with students on recognizing their negative self-talk and kind of taking a kinder, more productive, hmm, what did I get to learn from this <laughs> approach? As a psychologist, what are you seeing with how kids are thinking about everything that's happening right now? Yes, that's such a great question. Um, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of just kids feeling scared. They're nervous. Um, they're feeling, they're just not, we, we're really scared of what's what we don't know. And it is the unknown and how to tackle a lot of these difficult questions, uh, especially going back to school, what it's gonna look like. Um, some districts were very clear that they're not going back. Others, we are actually still in the waiting mode, uh, trying to see what's gonna happen. So I think all this unknown, uh, and I feel as educators as well, it's we just are not sure what's the next step. We have plans, but we're just not sure. And so a lot of the symptoms, like uh, I mentioned, are feeling scared, nervous, irritable, 
um, and frustrated as well. Um, and this is where we have to step in also as parents and educators and really help our kids to, to feel a little calm, but also living in the moment. I feel this is really important is that we live day by day. I was just saying this yesterday to someone is, you know, I know we like to plan so far away. We like to plan for the future, but at this point in time, planning so far out because we just don't know um, many of what's going to occur with the pandemic, um, just living in the moment is so important and planning your day out day by day or week by week and just taking it that way and just enjoying what you have right now. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think um, for kids, you know, I think the start of school is always, they're all, it's always kind of unknown. Will my teacher like me? Will it be as hard mm -hmm. as last year? Will it be better than last year? What if? But I have a feeling that that self-talk, you know, that negative self-talk that can go on with kids, well, with all of us really, but um, might be heightened for our kids this year. And I know you have a children's book coming out very soon. And I'd love for you to tell our viewers about it and share with them that strategy that you have for helping kids deal with those negative thoughts. Yes, I would love to. Uh, so the book, Frankie, it's called Frankie and the Worry Bees. Uh, it was born out of literally quarantine. Um, it's something I've been, I've always wanted to write um, a book. And it just, the you know, the opportunity presented itself and um, just really not thinking about it. it. It was during Zoom. And I had to come up with some really creative pictures so that kids can connect. Because I was noticing a lot of Zoom fatigue. I was noticing, um, you know, a lot of times my clients zoning in and out, and it was really hard for them to stay focused. And I even noticed myself through Zoom having to be more animated and keeping them engaged, especially if you're talking about a 45 minute session can be really difficult for kids, especially with attention span. So then you start thinking about, wow, what is school going to look like? Um, and then I started really understanding what it was like for them and how difficult, if it's difficult for us as adults, imagine for children. Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the images I have in the book is just Frankie. Uh, so the main character's name is Frankie and he has two bubbles above him and one has you know, a bunch of bees in it and the other one is empty um, right there. And the bees represent just the buzzing sounds, the negative thoughts, let's call it. Um, and we all have this as humans. I mean, if you go anywhere from ages, I've tested this on ages eight all the way up to 40 plus. And uh, people have been really responsive, even creating their own images, uh, maybe adding a ponytail to Frankie um, or, or just making it their own design. And the bees represent all the negative thoughts. So for example, let's take a Zoom example let's say the kid the child's in class and um during zoom and say i can't do this i'm not good enough i'm not going to succeed or i'm really scared and sharing all these feelings now the negative thoughts for them are very real and it's all about redirecting and creating pretty much an antonym in the empty bubble so saying things like i can do this i am smart uh, i will succeed i will try my best and the key here is to really repeat those positive thoughts every single day. Now, at first, children are like, oh, well, I don't believe that. That's not true. And I say, I know you don't believe it. Well, the, the whole point is to try to repeat those positive words. And I also give the example of when you wake up in the morning, if you're telling yourself, I'm going to have a bad day, you will have a bad day. It's just how we redirect and manifest things in our mind. Um, and it's all about starting on a positive note, even our energy when we come home as parents or, you know, sibling rival rivalry. If we come home and we're in a bad mood, especially even with, if it's with your spouse or your children or your friends, people are going to pick up on that. Um, and people feed off of positive and good energy. So it's really important to be able to redirect that and use Frankie um, as a helpful tool. And I will have those as downloadable links soon on my website. And parents can just print it out and use it as they like. Um, and so it's a really great tool to use. I, I love that. And it's so cute um, and you. really a great way to help 
any of us really, but to help your kids get out of that cycle of negative thoughts. Um, yes. So thank you for sharing that. Before we talk about tool number three for parents, choosing the best school option for your child's education and mental health, let's check back in with Maddie and our viewers. Hello. Well, before I jump into the chat, I just want to say how much I love from just hearing you talk um, about the concept of your book. That sounds like such an amazing way to kind of uh, take the idea of manifestation and like put it in something that kids can kind of like resonate with and they can see in front of them. That's so cool. I love that. It is. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, I do want to say hello to Evelyn. She's checking in. She says, good morning. I'm a college counselor looking forward to hearing this conversation. Thanks. We're excited to have you, Evelyn. Um, yeah, we've got a couple questions. So one of them is a mother saying that her daughter is 15. She says she was supposed to be able to go back to school uh, two days a week, but the school just let us know that they will be completely online. We're hearing this a lot. Uh, my daughter is angry at the school because she is really social and feels like she'll never get to see her friends again. Um, so do you have any suggestions for um, families who are going through this, which is basically everyone, <laughs> um, how to help them have a better attitude towards starting school? Yes. Um, I know I can totally empathize with that as my three kids. I have a 15, 10 and 12 year old. We're, we're all we're all in this together. I feel like it's I, I, you know, these are not just average questions. They're questions that as a country, nation, world, we're all experiencing. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that's really important, I mean, this is just something I've done at home. I'm doing with my clients and really about preparing them and, and just acknowledging that, again, this is not not going to last forever, right? We will eventually be back in our classrooms. Um, and going back to, but again, we're going back to the immediate anger and frustration that kids are feeling because it's so hard for them to think so far out um, that they are living in that moment right now. And what could be really helpful is just to, as a parent, is to validate her feelings and how, you know, kids want to be heard, they want to be validated. Um, and remembering that anger is an internal emotion and it's not necessarily they're angry towards their parent or they're angry towards the school itself. It's more about how they're expressing that emotion and really to validate and hear them out instead of saying something like, oh, don't worry, everything's going to be fine. That's maybe not what they want to hear. They want to hear, well, tell me more about how you feel and let's have a conversation about this. And really validating. I know you're angry. I can, I can just imagine we are all feeling this. Um, what can we do to make it better? And just really helping your team come up with their own solutions. Uh, for us, what's been really helpful is we just had this conversation actually last night um, and we're not starting for another two weeks. And the conversation was what would be your best study space? So imagine taking all three and figuring out what is the best study space for you. Each person gets to pick what they want to do, uh, whether it's in their room and maybe even, like I'm saying, adding something unique to their study space, maybe a flower, maybe some new, um, you know, uh, supplies or whatever it is that they feel comfortable with that's going to make them happy. I think that's going to be really important. Second is uh, socially, I'm hearing that's a really uh, vital uh, question that kids are having is I'm not going to see my friends, I'm not going to get to connect, I'm only going to see them on a screen. Um, so some, some kids have been successfully using, you know, just hanging out with about three friends or three close people uh, that they feel connected with, social distancing, meeting at the park, meeting outdoors, and making that a habit. Let's say if they do it, okay, every Wednesday or every Friday, and that way that could give them some relief in the now, because we can't really give an answer to when it's gonna go back full time. Uh, we don't wanna make empty promises, but at least giving them some hope and what to do in the moment right now. Oh, those are such great tips. I know. It's, I think the validation just goes such a long way with our kids. And I mean, anyone in general, like everyone wants to be validated and know what they're feeling is legit. You know, yeah. I had a student the other day, he was like, how much longer are we going to be doing this for? And I thought he was talking about the activity we were working on. Oh. And I was like, oh, there's the activity. And he's like, no, 
coronavirus. And I was like, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> like I don't know uh but yeah I'm definitely reassuring them it's not it's not forever um, and it feels it, it feels forever for them I feel like mm -hmm. they just feel stuck in the it's going back to being stuck in the now and them not being able to see so far out yes definitely yeah. definitely we have a few people saying hi. Hello, Karen. Thanks for checking in. Always good to hear from you. We did have Candice um, on the previous uh, link saying hello. So hi, Candice, and <laughs> thanks for checking in. I can't pull your comments up because it's not here anymore, but thank you for watching, of course. Um, I know there's a lot coming up right now for parents. Um, you know, especially if their kids have difficulties with learning and attention. So I just want to make sure that everyone knows about our Facebook group, Mom Squad. I know we've been mentioning it a lot, but of course we have new listeners every week. So we do have our Facebook support group, Mom Squad. If you do ever want to connect with other parents and maybe get some questions answered, that is always a resource there for you. And if you are watching on the replay and you're not able to ask your questions live, you can always ask them there as well. Great. Thank you, Maddie. And thank you to all of you who have joined us in spite of our uh, little trip up at the beginning. It's really fun to see our subscribers and new people on the broadcast. This is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell. Uh, with our guest, clinical psychologist and author, Dr. Regine Maradian. We've been talking about five tools for navigating the pandemic and the start of school. We talked about the very normal feeling of non-movement fatigue and about controlling negative thoughts. So let's jump in and talk a little bit about school. One of the things that families are really wrestling with this year is what school option is best for their child's learning and mental health. We know kids miss their teachers and their friends, and there's been a lot of talk about getting kids back into school physically. What is your take on that issue? I know that the golden question of the day. Um, so, you know, I, I feel like since we are in California, I, I'm, we're just following the news and seeing what's going on around the state and around the United States and how uh, some schools are going back hybrid and class, you know, hybrid slash distance learning. Um, and right now I just have to speak to just what's out there and just with the CDC. And as we know, we've just been getting letters from the schools and announcements as, you know, they were moving towards hybrid versus um, being distance learning. And right now, because of the cases, obviously, uh, the children's safety is priority, um, educator safety, elderly safety. Uh, so I feel that the schools that are not implementing uh, a hybrid option, um, it's, it is best, I believe, right now at this point for the distance learning. Of course, we would want all our children to be back in the classroom. I just think that they're trying to figure out and working so hard um, to figure out what's the best option. Again, we there's so many different options, public school, private schools, you have a smaller schooler settings that could do it. So of course, schools that are capable, I've heard even um, of schools doing the classrooms outdoors, and uh, which sounds really amazing and great. But again, we think about for how long um, would that be? The other uh, thing that we have to think about is although the idea sounds amazing and great is what is it going to look like from kindergarten through eighth grade? First of all, they're going to be wearing masks all day. Uh, teachers are going to be wearing masks and a shield, uh, distance, socially distancing from their peers. So my main concern goes back to the psychological effects of that and what that's going to mean. Are they going to be able to hear their teachers properly uh, through the mask. I even noticed even when you're ordering something, it's just so hard for the other person just to hear what you're saying. Um, I can imagine how difficult it could be for even the educators to monitor all the, um, I mean, their kids. So taking off their mask, putting back the mask, taking off the mask, um, kids staying socially distant, stay away from Johnny, stay away from Jack, and how difficult that could be. So um, again, I, I know that for some parents, I can just imagine, and 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 we you know a lot of people like that who are just firefighters or uh, working in labs or 
Um, they just don't have that option of staying home with their children. And so that's another big question and how the schools can support those kids. Um, and I'm, I'm really hopefully that they can come up with an option. But right now with what we have, I really believe that just again, for the protection and what it's going to look like on the school grounds, what is the best option, especially as we enter fall um, and distance learning right now, even though not the most viable option in terms of learning, but it is the best that we have right now. And I was just thinking how fortunate we are to have technology. What if we were living in a time without right. technology, what would occur? And I know it's so easy to go to the negative and think about, well, my kid's not learning. How am I going to do this? Um, and that's where I can also speak for myself as a working parent. I'm working full time. My husband's working full time. Um, and we've already had this discussion with the kids. And I'm also sharing the same thing with my clients. And I have parents who are teachers. Um, and they have younger kids as young as second grade or third grade. And what occurs then? And I, I think it's going to build a lot of independence for children in terms of taking care of themselves. Uh, and we can definitely go into more detailed solutions on that. Uh, yeah. Like. And, oh, I, I, I do want to, you know, I think, I think the perspective, you know, we hear a lot about, well, for kids, mental health, they need to be in school around their peers. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and I just, you know, I think this perspective is important as well, just so that parents are really considering all the information that, that schools really will look different when they come back and, and just even, you know, kind of policing it to make sure that everybody's social distanced and how that feels. I heard, um, it, I just think it's an important, you know, piece of the puzzle to think about, especially for, for yes. your individual child. I heard an associate professor of education from Seton Hall College say that, that, when they go back, uh, it will be like a combination of a monastery and a, a minimum security prison. And mm. I was like, and and the commentator <laughs> said, well, that doesn't sound like a lot of fun. Um, yeah. So, you know, I mean, those are things that we have to think about. How is your child gonna, gonna react to that um, when mm. they're used to being able to be real close with their friends? Um, but, if remote schooling is not possible or not mm. truly not the best option for the child or the family for whatever reason, then spending some time educating and preparing your kids in advance is helpful. You know, mm -hmm. talk to them about how we're all working together to take care of each other. And this year that means masks and social distancing mm -hmm. because that's a way that they can take care of their friends and their teachers. And then practicing what it's like to talk to friends at a six foot distance. I really liked the idea that you talked about with maybe having a small little group of friends, two or three people that get together outside on a regular basis and still social distance and do all the precautions, but but kind of practicing how to do that. Um, mm -hmm. You certainly don't want the first time that your child wears a mask for a long period of time to be on the first day of school. So they need to wear a mask at home to practice, you know, what that's going to yeah. be like. And, mm -hmm. and then um, dialoguing, especially with teens, about mm -hmm. what issues might come up in advance so that you can talk about what they should say. Yes. So, um, you know, um, wearing masks for a long period of time is going to be challenging for kids. But I, I saw this little girl, she had this cute little mask and she said, well, as long as it's cute, it's okay. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> decorating their masks might yeah. make it fun or make it a fashion statement, you know, so. Well, and, 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 and then that's very true. And that for them also to have that choice, um, and and selection. And I, I really believe that if as parents were role modeling the mask wearing um, outside of the home when we're leaving the house, et cetera, uh, it also shows them that it's okay to wear it. And I think it's just that at some point they will become used to it and familiar. And mm -hmm. then it goes back to control. Like you said, is them controlling 
what color mask they're buying, what they're, and I, I know Crayola has made, uh, so many yeah. different companies have made such cute masks uh, for kids because this is where we're at right now. And uh, it's eventually going to be normalized. I think that fall right now as schools, some schools are going back. I've heard hybrid, you know, a hybrid option. And uh, so at least they get the best of both worlds in this timing. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that is important for them to kind of know what they're expecting. And I know some are going back just an hour. Some are going back two hours and coming home. And so there's going to be a lot of feelings and emotions just surrounding that. And how was their day? So I think communication is so key right now um, and really hearing what they have to say, listening, listening versus us giving how do I say it? the lecture, so to speak, is yeah. hearing them speak out because this is just them purging a lot of their emotions and a lot of these feelings that they probably didn't even realize they had uh, before. Yeah, really important. You know, a, a lot of schools, certainly in California, many schools will be starting the school year with distance learning. And in March, when schools closed and went to remote classes, it kind of turned a lot of families upside down. So what do mm -hmm. parents need to know about setting their child up for distance learning success? Mm -hmm. So let's start. So now we're still in summer. Um, I, I know some schools are not going back till next week and the following, some at the end of the month and some back in September. So just choosing, uh, let's start with bedtime routine. Um, I, another thing I'm hearing a lot in terms of symptoms is insomnia. Kids mm -hmm. having a really hard time falling asleep. So if they're falling asleep at midnight, one in the morning, two in the morning, uh, and a lot of times you ask why, and they'll say, well, just so much on my mind. Mm -hmm. And that tells me that there's not enough expression on their end of their emotions. So number one is creating with them, having that conversation of, of School starting next week, uh, we're going to be starting our bedtime routine. What time do you think you should be going to bed? You know, you just kind of start the conversation that way. And they may say, uh, 12. And then parent will say, well, let's work a little. Well, you know, you need to get how many hours of sleep. So then we kind of come down to a resolution to, let's say, 10 p.m. or 9 p.m. Um, I do recommend, obviously, about 9 to 10 hours of sleep for children uh, for their brain development. So that's really important. And hopefully, you know, I know it's hard during the summer to maintain that. So creating a strict, you know, a school schedule in terms of wake up time and I mean, bedtime and wake up time and creating that with your child. Uh, that's step one, just so that they get in the routine of things. A lot of kids will say, yes, I, I do wish I went to bed earlier last year. I didn't go to bed you know, I started the routine the day, the night before, and I was so cranky and I was irritable mm -hmm. and I was tired. And so these are good things to talk over and create that schedule. And, and that alone makes things feel more normal, getting back onto a, oh, a yes. real schedule. Yes. I'm, I'm really, I mean, just myself as a parent, we're really looking forward to that schedule. And we, I think kids thrive on schedules. They do well. Um, and, and I think that's going to be really important too with distance learning as they wake up, just as if you were going to school. So getting up in the morning, getting dressed, uh, you know, brushing your teeth, washing your face, looking presentable, especially online. Um, definitely not being in your bed while you're studying. Um, and that's why we went back to creating that space, uh, study space for kids so that they feel comfortable. And they know this is where I'm sitting. Mm -hmm. uh, another important thing is a chair, having a really good, comfortable chair. You're going to be sitting on that chair for most of the day. I am assuming that the distance learning this time around is going to be very well prepared compared to March. Back in March, teachers were learning as they were going. They didn't know as much, especially with technology. It's not something we learn in school um, on how to be a teacher, figuring out distance learning piece. So that's going to be another important thing is just setting them up for success in their space. If you feel comfortable in your space and you're organized, um, such as having all your pencils ready or your colored pencils, whatever it is, uh, they will feel prepared and feel good. And I think they should be part of that process. Uh, so if you're not going to go outside and, and, and purchase your supplies, do it together online. You know, if you're going on Amazon and you're just getting your notebooks, make it fun. And, uh, and definitely once school starts, having a time to even check in with our children at the end of the day. 
You know, um, those are really, really good suggestions. And I know you have many more actually. Um, part of the challenge for parents with distance learning is that they may also be working from home. Mm -hmm. and, and so, as you said, kids are going to have to become more independent, but a lot of kids aren't independent, aren't used yeah. to that. So do you have suggestions mm -hmm. for how parents can kind of manage this? Yes, yes, very, very good question. Um, I, I feel that what's going to be important is having, again, that conversation of let's get you a little notebook. And this notebook, let's call it the problem solution notebook. And then the kid's like, what does that mean? <laughs> or they can choose their own name. And in that notebook, what they can do. So, for example, you're working in the other room or maybe you're working right beside them. I know a lot of parents that have already set up just some space where they're going to have their child next to them. and I'm really hoping I, this is that companies are going to be compassionate and understanding that parents are going to be at home. So there could be disturbances. Uh, some parents are not even scheduling meetings during the school hours. So how do you make that work? Again, I know there's so many different professions and people out there in terms of what they're doing and what they can do. So I'm just speaking more in general. Um, and in this, going back to the problem solution notebook, for example, let's say they are in a math class. Math is the hardest subject to teach online. This is my, my number one complaint. And that's because some children, like you know, are more visual learners and need the teacher there to explain that math concept. Sometimes parents can't stop what they're doing at that moment and explain the math concept. Because with distance learning, what's gonna happen is they're gonna have a 20 minute, let's say, lecture with the teacher at all grade levels, and then kids will have some time to do their work independently. And I think that's where the problem is going to occur is child is gonna get stuck on a problem and we'll call parent, and that's when we could see chaos and conflict arise. So what do we do? We have to prepare them for that happening. If it doesn't happen, wonderful. But if it does, at least we are ready and we have the go ahead. So what I recommend is having that conversation and saying, okay, if you don't, if you don't understand something, write it down in your little notebook, page 39, exercise number two, and I will check with you when I am ready. And creating that conversation with your child, do you, I mean, I'm, I'm sure a lot of parents can connect with this. Do you remember when kids are little and when you're on the phone, even as teenagers, and they come and bother you and they always have a question? So it is important, we can't get upset at that. We have to explain to them and have that conversation of please, you know what, you, we are gonna be, this is how we're gonna be working. Mom's gonna be here, dad's gonna be here, or maybe there's a grandparent, or maybe there's another caregiver. This is gonna be our situation. If you're stuck and you don't know something, please write it down. Now, the goal of that notebook is so great because at the end of the day, let's assume that the parent cannot help at all until 5 p.m., let's assume. The parent can get into the habit and explain to their child when mommy's done with work or when dad's done with their work we will go over all these things and and that i think will ease their anxiety because they will know that they will be attended to mm -hmm. worst case scenario the parent is not able to help it's creating that log and being able to reach out to the teacher for support i am certain that teachers are going to be more compassionate than ever more helpful everyone is feeling the same emotions so I can't even imagine a teacher not wanting to help or support the student if they're really struggling. Uh, so that's how the parent can kind of intervene. But again, having that primal conversation before is so vital so that we're all prepared. And I give the supermarket example. Do you remember when kids were, when our kids, gosh, I remember when they were two or three years old or five years old, or even now you go into the market and like, I want this, I want that. It's all about preparing them. So what do we do in the car? listen, I'm going into the market and I'm only buying milk and eggs. That's all I'm getting. Is that understood? Don't ask me for anything else. Otherwise we will leave. And it's really important that you stick to your word. And if they do have a tantrum that you do leave. So most of the time, what we notice is what happens. There's no tantrum in the market because you've already prepared them ahead of time. And kids are so amazing and intelligent and they really want to please parents at the end of the day. So that really can help with more difficult behaviors 
and um, just using that same type of technique. So again, we go back to communication and having that conversation. I just, mm -hmm. I just think that is huge in so many different scenarios, you know, is just preparing them in advance for what to expect. Because otherwise, you know, this impulsiveness that the children have may take over and then they're, then they're stuck in that moment and they can't get out of it. But if they've been prepared in advance, then, you know, now they know what to expect. They don't have to, it doesn't have to become a crisis. So. Yes, exactly. And, and that goes back to also procrastination questions and lack of motivation. So again, it goes back when we are prepared and it's even like preparing for a test. When you're prepared and you feel good about it and you know you've done everything in your power and you've done your best, you will be less anxious. Mm -hmm. So do you have any thoughts about Zoom fatigue? Mm -hmm. I'm hearing that some schools are really looking at five to six hours a day on Zoom. That mm -hmm. will be tiring for everyone. That would be tiring for anyone. Um, so do you have any suggestions about that? Yes. Oh, gosh. So Zoom fatigue is, uh, God, we, I think we've all been experiencing. I think we can agree on that. Um, there are, obviously, there are, uh, just let's talk just about the physical components. So first of all, being on a laptop is very important versus kids being on a phone device because the phone device, the screen is so small. And so I think that, you know, the eyes kind of narrow down into the screen, which can cause uh, muscle strain and muscle aches. So really important to be on a laptop and setting it up on your desk uh, in a comfortable mode and just and, and trying to really focus that way. Uh, number two, what's going to be really important, and this again is going to vary between teachers and students and school regulations and policies, but I really think that, you know, I, I go by five years old, five minute attention span, six years old, six minute attention span. So keep that number in mind. Kids have a very short attention span in general. Even when I'm giving homework uh, recommendations, I tell them like put a timer for 30 minutes and then take a break for five minutes. And take a break means getting up, maybe stretching, taking a deep breath, and really helping them regroup and then come back. Uh, I think kids, if they know they have that opportunity to get up every 30 minutes, again, I'm not sure what every person's school schedule would look like and how teachers, I'm, I'm hoping that teachers can kind of mold and create that environment for kids online. Uh, because the reality is, Imagine you're on a screen and you have 30 students, one teacher. That's going to be really difficult. And now I know, I know that they are requiring kids to show themselves. Some have to be in, if they're wearing a uniform for school, have to be in uniform. Uh, they have to keep their screen on because, I, you know, what's happening is they're going to the other devices and not paying attention. So I do like that. But I think we have to be compassionate, understanding that these are kids. They are not used to being online so much. and so really giving them 30 minutes, let's take a five minute break, 30 minutes, take a five minute break. So that would be ideal in terms to reducing the Zoom uh, fatigue piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and also maybe reducing devices after school, um, device usage, if possible, and creating more of a time frame. Okay, you can only have maybe one hour on social media or whatever it is that they're doing at that, depending on the age range. So that could be helpful. Great. Um, if you're just joining us today, I'm Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers, and my guest is mm. Dr. Regine Maradian. She has given us so many tools for preparing for distance learning. If you know other parents who need this information, please be sure and share. And uh, let's check in with Maddie, see what's happening there. Hello. Um, I just want to say hi to Lauren. She looks like she likes the video on Facebook. If you don't know, um, Lauren was previously doing my job here and she's on maternity leave. She just had a baby. So hope um, Avalon is doing good. We miss you. We do have a question coming in from Evelyn. She says that lack of motivation is a huge problem right now. How can students stay motivated when they aren't working together and pushing each other to learn more successfully? 
Oh gosh, that is, wow, one of my favorites. Um, I, I'm just smiling because I hear this so much. Uh, and I'm, I'm gonna go back to the pods on that question. So motivation, you know, especially nowadays, kids um, are doing a lot of collaborative work. So that's such a good point. A lot of collaborative learning. Um, I've even seen in some schools, the desks are kind of like together. There's like four desks attached. Um, you know, in a U-shaped form where they have four children working together. And we know that collaborative work works so well for us to stay motivated, absolutely. So one thing that we can do to emulate this at home, and again, this is all this advice and recommendations we are giving today um, from my end is something that you as a family have to decide if that works for you. Um, because there is no wrong question with this pandemic and how you feel about COVID-19. Some parents are not even exiting their home. They are staying in. They're only ordering through Instacart. Some parents are outside and mingling with other people. So everyone has a very different feel. So I want to mention that as I answer this question. I'm going to go back to the, the pod kind of work. So having maybe three students or three close friends from your child's classroom that feel comfortable and creating maybe a, a study pod. So where you kind of switch off in between, again, homes, but again, it remains the question with the mask. Are they gonna be wearing the mask when they're all together? That's more of a personal uh, feel for you. So if they're able to socially distance, let's say, I'm just imagining a dining table, for example, and you have three kids, two on each end and one in the middle, that's kind of some, hopefully if it's a bait large enough table, social distance, or worst case scenario, if you feel more comfortable than wearing a mask, wear a mask. Um, or maybe they're doing this outside as the weather permits in California. They can sit outside and we can create that space. Now, number one, they're working together, let's say every Wednesdays, and they have something to look forward to. Number two, they are socializing um, during that study time. So uh, I believe that there are some ways that we can keep them motivated um, and interact that way. Um, of course, boys are playing video games, girls are playing video games, they're connecting that way and staying socially connected. But with school and schoolwork and as subjects become more intense, it's so important that I believe, yes, that they have that connectivity. Some classes like social studies have projects and they have to do group projects together. Um, so I believe it is feasible. We just have to be a little more creative than we used to. And if that means setting them up outside, meeting once a week together. So at least they have something to look forward to. You don't want them to be so monotone Monday through Friday in that same mm -hmm. space. I think they're going to burn out pretty quickly. Um, another thing that could be helpful is some kids like to even move around. One week I'm sitting at my desk here. The next week I'm sitting in the living room. Uh, whatever feels comfortable with them. I think this is why it's so important to check in with them and how do they feel at the end of each day and really keeping track of that because if their emotions are validated and we listen to them, they're more likely to do well. Um, we can't eliminate, a de I mean, there's gonna be a lack of motivation, period. We know that because we're not in a normal school setting. We're not motivated by the teacher. Uh, we're not motivated by our peers. So we have to kind of figure out other ways. So the pods could be a great way uh, to interact and keep them on task. What great suggestions. I know for me, I'm a very competitive person. I know not everyone's like that, but when there's no one to compete with, it's like, how are you supposed to stay motivated? It's like everyone's so far away. I know everyone's yes. that way, but um, yeah, definitely a topic that people resonate with. Ron K is just saying that, you know, motivation mm -hmm. is a huge challenge and she appreciates yeah. um, your thoughts. So thank you. I did have a thought when you were talking about kind of, um, you know, everyone's going to have their own views as to what's safe. And I'm thinking of families who are wanting their kids to socialize, but still, you know, have their mask on and social distance. I'm thinking, what about kids who are super soft spoken and have a difficult time, like projecting their voice? Maybe they're not super comfortable that way. Do you have any tips for, I don't know, dialoguing with them on maybe how they could be more comfortable, like talking louder or anything like that? 
Yeah, that's such, you know, I, that's a, a good point that you bring up, especially, and I did, I have noticed this, that imagine you have a class of 30 on Zoom and there's only like, I have noticed this, that there's only maybe about two to three kids who are popping out and are outspoken. Maybe they're just more extroverts and more open and they, they, they feel very comfortable on screen. And remember that we are, kids are seeing themselves on screen. So we have a lot of also, it's such a fragile age you know, all the, the tweens and teens and younger uh, kids seeing themselves and thinking that they don't look good, for example. So you have that body self image piece that automatically comes in, which shuts them down. And they feel, oh, I'm not gonna speak up because now everyone is watching me and how difficult that could be for them. So again, we go back to talking about those feelings. So if you notice that about your child, um, you know, that's part of their personality. We have to, uh, give them a lot of praise and, uh, you know, how do we improve on a weakness, let's say, if we notice that they're soft-spoken and not projecting their voice. So even practicing together, the parent can practice with their child. Um, it could be anything. It could be a conversation. Oh, speak a little louder. Let me hear you. Let's, you know, especially if you're going to be online, your teacher may not be able to hear you. Let's practice that. And just having fun with it. Um, another suggestion I just love with, I love using books again, as an example is if you're doing a reading, let's say if they have a reading exercise to read, like a reading comprehension, having them read it out loud to the parent, and maybe the parent can use that as a gateway to increase their voice projection. Oh, could you say that a little louder? If you were reading this in class, I know it would sound this way, but when you're on Zoom, it's gonna sound in a different way. So let's practice that together. What do you think about that? So always ending it with a question so that they can feel in control and they feel good about themselves because these are all just, you know, we all have weaknesses that we have to work on and improve on. So uh, that could be a good uh, uh, example to work on, especially if you're wearing, well, at home they're not wearing the mask, but if they were, let's say, in class eventually, and you have the mask, they would have to really practice that projection piece. Uh, but at home, it's great to kind of start that as a conversation and having them practice practice it through reading or uh, just through conversation. And, and even through, sometimes when we've had really soft-spoken kids, um, we will, um, you know, we'll just really play with the voice. We might, get really yeah. silly with it and and surprise them by ourselves getting really loud and boisterous yeah. and then and then they laugh about it and then you know we try to get them to mimic what we're doing or or you know talk about um a whisper voice and a radio voice or you know just just to play with it and have some fun with it but again going back to there are two things that keep coming through that I love, um, practicing and, and giving them some control so that, you know, finding ways for them to feel like they're in control. Yeah, yeah, because there's, there's so much fatigue going on. I mean, it's just gonna be difficult. We know that them just being online this way. Um, if you just imagine us as adults being online for eight to 10 hours a day and how tired you are. I've had a lot of people say, every hour I'm on Zoom, it's as if it's three hours or four hours of my brain power. So we have to be compassionate towards our kids to what they're mm -hmm. feeling. And I think there's gonna be a lot of conversation with teachers and explaining to them, because every child is so unique in their own way and is gonna present with their own challenges. So this is where now, now more than ever, before the pandemic, Honestly, we were, you can do this on your own. You need to contact your teacher. And we still want to um, enforce that for kids to be able to speak up. But if we're noticing that they're having maybe a hard time, let's be gentle with that and support them in that reach out. And, you know, even help the teacher come up with some solutions. I, I feel that that could be helpful because it is what the teacher can provide for this child. Right. Um, and possibly, I would love for it to be great for teachers, you know, to kind of play the Muppet voices and just have some fun. I'm finding myself being very animated on Zoom with my younger kids uh, clientele. And I'm speaking louder, I'm making 
gestures and faces so that they can, and they start laughing and they start engaging. Um, and we do a lot of drawings and creativity. And I think that's what really helps to keep them on. Uh, Cause it's a long time. I mean, my sessions, for example, are 45 minutes. So that just really helps them to stay on. And I praise them at the end. Well, I'm so proud of you. You stayed on for this long. Mm -hmm. This is so great. Um, and noticing when they're getting distracted. Now for teachers, I don't recommend that because you don't want to uh, put them on the spot. Like, hey, Johnny, you're not paying attention. I think we should kind of try to refrain. I, I do recommend for teachers uh, to, to refrain from it because then just everyone's gonna then start staring at Johnny at that moment and we don't wanna create that. So I think there's gonna be a lot of sensitivity around how we navigate uh, the classroom environment online. Yeah, but I, you know, I also, I know from teaching seminars that, <laughs> and, and I teach educators and I notice when one person starts to get a little bit antsy, it's sort of a trigger to me, okay, it's starting. Everybody needs a yeah. little bit of a break. And, and so even for teachers, if they start to notice one or two kids are, are starting to yawn a lot or, or get kind of antsy, that would be a great time for everybody in the class to stand up and take a really good stretch, you know, just move. Because if one or two kids are feeling it, probably, you know, the majority of the others are, are feeling it or are going too soon anyway. Yeah. And, and I wanted to bring up, as you mentioned that, I love that is um, maybe creating a two minute exercise. Teachers can get up and say, okay, let's do some jumping jacks. I mean, if they're checking in online at 7.50 AM or 8 AM, they're already like, they're, first of all, they haven't, they're, remember the non-movement fatigue, they're in non-movement fatigue phase. So they have not They've gone up, but they're not in that rush mode phase. Mm -hmm. We haven't done a car ride. We haven't done a drop off. You haven't had that stimulation with your peers right before you go into class. I mean, there's a whole brain activity that occurs and energy that is given just through all those little interactions during the day, even saying goodbye to mom and dad. And they're not going to have that. So automatically, you know, just having the teacher just be fun and doing even some jumping jacks or deep breathing so that they can um, just get in the motion of things and get excited about, about class. And I go back to the 30 minute break, the 30 minute increments would be mm -hmm. so, so important. I, honestly, at all age levels um, to really help them stay engaged. Absolutely. Yeah. Definitely. We definitely see the same thing in our centers. Um, it's right. amazing what just so we call them body breaks, but what like a little body break just movement can do. It's it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, we do have a question from Moronke. She's actually a, a professor in Michigan. So she says in Michigan right now, um, everything's virtual, 100% mm -hmm. virtual. So she's wondering, uh, this was kind of going off your point about collaboration. Will it be good to get um, the school staff to help create small groups where the students mm -hmm. can motivate and hold each other accountable? What do you think that oh, might look like? I, yes, I, I love that. Um, I'm a big believer in small cohorts and, and group work. I love group work. I think that we learn better. Uh, for example, if you have student A, reading chapter three three pages and then creating a summary and teaching another student that summary could be really helpful and this is all about engaging them and creating conversation amongst themselves on that specific topic uh i i like the small groups and if that is possible even virtually i think it'll be more successful than having 30 kids in a class at the same time i think teachers are going to lose them in terms of connectivity so even if saying, okay, we're going to break you guys up in group, groups of four. Um, I have heard too that kids, if they're not monitored, they're going to be doing something else. So I'm not sure it would be great to have a teacher, um, if it's possible, the teacher to moderate again with technology, how that would work. Uh, but that would be a great idea. Yes. And I think more, it, it can increase motivation on their end and hold them accountable too for the work that they have to do. So I do like that. Even during quarantine, I remember even my kids had a project and they had to work with someone else. And it was great because that other person held them also accountable for the work that had to be done. So group projects can be really wonderful. I even know some summer schools here in California that were open 
uh, through the summer, they were just testing out how things were working and they had very small cohorts. So five students, five to 10 students at a time in a classroom, social distancing, and it worked. I mean, they were, they were just happy to be in school. I think at this point, I haven't heard yet kids saying, oh gosh, the mask is gonna bother me. These are just things we are thinking that could happen. I just think they are so thrilled to be with their friends. This is how they should learn. Learning at this, especially at this young age is collaborative. Even in the, at the university level, it, as we remember, I loved collaborative work. I mean, that's, it just, it's just, it just has a different feel um, in terms of our learning. And it really, it really is possible with Zoom and other platforms, yeah. you know, to um, to do collaborative, you know, or even little breakout groups, you know, with mm -hmm. with some of the things that Google Classroom has. So, uh, yes. and, 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 and it's motivating, even if you're even if you're virtual, it's probably motivating to work with your friends. Yes, and they can even afterwards present to the class maybe on that topic. You know, let's break up in groups and then we'll do little presentations, uh, which again think goes back to the projective voice and really practicing how to present. I think this is another positive in our time of devices where, you know, before quarantine, we were talking about a lack of eye contact, that kids had a really hard time holding on to a conversation. Um, this generation. So I think this is all this, you know, we have to look at the positives and what we can take out of this, which is independent learning, learning how to uh, present, learning how to interview others, learning how to work in a different workspace. And kids are like chameleons. I mean, they just mold to what comes. I think we as parents get a little more nervous and anxious about how it's going to look like for our kids. But I think we'll be very surprised at the benefits that we are going to see coming out of this. Um, obviously, another question is, are they going to be learning? I mean, I think that's all parents' concerns. Is my kid going to be learning enough? Um, and that is to see. Uh, I, I don't think it's going to be as beneficial as being in class. I think we all have to accept that, but we are all in this together and there's not much we can do. I think everyone is doing their best and we have to just do our best and, really hope that we will get out of this soon and uh, and take all the positives that we've learned through this experience. Definitely, definitely some great perspective. I, yeah. I mean, we always come at things from, you know, more of an educational standpoint, not that, you know, of course, we're concerned with our kids well being, of course, um, but it's just really interesting to hear a more psychological approach. So I really like that. Um, Jill, I know you'll probably have some thoughts on this next question. Um, a parent expresses, distance learning was awful for us because my child has learning differences. He's mm -hmm. smart, but he needs my help all of the time. So any thoughts on that one? You know, um, I think there are a lot of really key things that we've covered that I think are important. Having a really clear structure around school and a space, you know, for him to work in. Um, and, you know, earlier I was thinking about um, when we were talking about working parents, how um, Dr. Maradian, you said uh, some parents are even setting up where they, you know, maybe their child is on the computer and they're at the same table on the computer. And I thought, you know, in a way that is a really great model for the child. Um, but with your child who tends to not be independent, mm -hmm. um, you have to practice and talk through exactly what he is going to be doing, how he's going to be sitting, you know, where he's going to be looking, what he's going to be doing with his online lessons with the teacher. And then with the independent work, I mean, it's really challenging when your child doesn't have the skills to do the job. But kids can kind of surprise us because we we get in the habit of they get in the habit of asking all the time for help mm -hmm. and they get in the habit of us being there and we get in the habit of being there. And um, and this is going to kind of force us to break that habit because it's not just homework, which could have dragged out for hours. It's a whole day of school. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think um, 
you know, again, preparing ahead of time, talking together, but, but uh, determining an amount of time that is reasonable for your child to work independently on that work and, um, you know, go over what, whatever it is that he had to do, have him verbalize what he has to do and then set the timer. And it may be 10 minutes or it may be 30 minutes, whatever you feel like is going to be reasonable for your child. And then you can build it up from there. But, but during that period of time, his job is to do everything he can on his own. And if there's something mm -hmm. he doesn't know, skip it, write it in his little notebook. Or I was thinking with our kids that just hate writing. So that would be torture. Mm -hmm. Even taking one of those little tab post-its, you know, and just putting it right on the problem that they didn't get so that they don't get stuck. They keep doing whatever they can. And then when the timer goes off, you can, you know, go talk through the pieces that he didn't understand, set him up for the next piece and really validate him for the time that he spent working independently, even if he didn't get as much done as you thought that maybe he should have, validate what he did do because it was independent. And part of the learning you're trying, you have to get is for him to do everything that he can independently. And that's a new thing for him. Um, and it, it, yeah. yeah, go ahead, Dr. I was going to say, especially in, in the public schools, um, you know, when I do my school, my, I do uh, neuropsych and assessments, uh, psychological evaluations for kids. So when I'm in, you know, let's say in a learning disability and what, uh, with my learning disability children, there are a lot of aids in the classroom. So we have to be mindful of what they are used to. So there's a teacher, there's maybe a couple aids where they could raise their hand and get the support that they need. So I love that idea of just the question that they have that they would ask the aide and trying to help them see virtually, well, if you were in the classroom, how would you have done it? And going through those stages with them, uh, I think would also be helpful because, and that's part of the preparation process. We won't have that. This is what it's going to look like. So what are, what are your thoughts of maybe putting it in, writing it down or putting the post-it on things you're not understanding? Because I think some kids also, depending on personality type, can get very stuck. And they may feel, oh, if I can't move away from problem 33, I can't continue. Oh my gosh, I'm a failure. And immediately they go into this negative thinking and they give up. Um, I can just imagine at the center too, if they're not able to complete a task, how frustrating they frustrated they feel and they can't move on. So praising them for even for that one problem that got done. We have to be, I mean, this is just us as parents, educators, we have to be compassionate and accepting of whatever we are getting at this point. It doesn't mean lowering expectations, but having more compassion and understanding that these kids are doing it on their own and they do not have a teacher there supporting them and helping them and that we as parents are taking on this role, uh, but also the teachers are doing the best they can. I can just have empathy and compassion for all educators out there, what this is going to be like for them, hats off to them. Uh, and we have to be, as parents, we have to work nicely without anger and being very compassionate with our educators, compassionate with all the people that are helping our kids and, you know, understanding that they're struggling too. And how can we work together? If we come across as calm and um, collected and we come with a help uh, attitude, then I think things will resolve themselves and we will find a solution. But if we come across as, oh my gosh, my kid is failing, you're not helping them. And if we come across that way, I don't think we're going to get a positive response back. It's going to be a little harder to work with. So, and also we're emulating those behaviors as well to our children. So that's another important uh, factor for sure. Yes, definitely. All yeah. great, all great advice. <laughs> yeah. We're gonna have to rewatch yeah. some parts to make sure I got all the information. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, you. I do want to take the chance to remind um, 
some people who might be joining a little bit um, towards the end that we do, of course, always have our Facebook group Mom Squad available for you. It's an awesome support group if you are looking to connect with other parents and maybe get some questions answered. If you ever something pops in your head and, you know, we don't have the show for a few more days, you can always leave your questions there and maybe even another parent will be able to answer it for you. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much, Maddie. And thank you, Dr. Marathi. And this was, wow, thank there you. were just such a wealth of information for us uh, that I think is relevant to everybody right now. Uh, thank you. I would just, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you so much for having oh, me. Thank you. Oh, I am so glad that, that you joined us. Dr. Maradian practices in Glendale and Beverly Hills, California and surrounding areas. Uh, be sure to check out her website and be on the lookout for her new book, Frankie and the Worry Bees. I think that's gonna be awesome. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia and auditory and attention challenges. Next Tuesday, we are delighted to have Dr. Giancarlo Licata back with us to talk about attention and ADHD. Attention is a huge factor in learning success, so be sure to join us at 10 a.m. Pacific. Stowell Learning Centers are open for remote sessions and screenings. We're also seeing students on site with all of the COVID precautions. We work with children and adults doing targeted brain training to improve thinking and learning. If you would like a free consultation for yourself or your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. Thank you so much, Dr. Maradian, for all the insights and tips for navigating this pandemic and the start of school. If you are finding these broadcasts helpful, hit that subscribe button and be sure and share with your friends. We'll see you next week.